What up, meatheads? This is Travis, American Butcher, and this is the Meat Block Podcast, the weekly pie cut. The oh my god! What up, meatheads? This is Travis, American Butcher, and this is the Meat Block Podcast, the weekly podcast by butchers for everyone. In this one, we're going to be talking about legs, specifically pork legs, and I'm going to jump right into it because I'm rushed for time because of scheduling. I'm selling my house and. I'm not staying here, and I had to come back between here and driving into Everett, and it's just I'm on the the go, uh, so I'm I'm pushing this out. Uh, this is the night before it gets released, and I hope you enjoy it, and hope it doesn't come through in any fraction or part of it. All right, meat block. Hey, meatheads. David here. When I was working in Seattle at a small, whole, mostly whole animal butcher shop back in 2014, our receiving schedule looked a little like this. We'd get a half of beef or, you know, a side of beef per week, each grass fed, um, and from within about 100 miles of the shop. In addition to that beef, we brought in boxed middle meats such as rib exports and tenderloins. Uh, Because Christ knows that programmers can't do without their filet, bro. Also, we received two whole lamb a week, as well as two to maybe three whole hogs in split half. We had a rail in there, so they'd just hang in the cooler. Often they came wrapped in cling wrap in the back of a creeper van under a swaddling of ice blankets, you know, with a farmer dropping off whatever it was. Now, we'd have no problem selling through our hogs, our beef, or our lamb. And it was nice to get something fresh every week. You know, we'd case up the standards. Bone in, for, as far as hogs go, uh, we'd case up bone in chops, tenderloins, butt roasts, copa ribs, cushion, which we called pork brisket because it was a conversation starter. We didn't have a smoker, so bellies went fresh, or um, we made a couple different types of pancetta there. We did a flat one and a rolled one, different spices and and whatnot. Trotters went into the broth. Uh, we'd make like a, a pho broth. And sometimes shanks sold, but usually they went into value-added farce meats. The hams usually went to sausage. That was our main source of trim for our links. Uh, but... When the case and the back sock were totally full of brats or what have you, the leg was sometimes a challenge to purpose. Fresh hams didn't really sell well most of the year. Except for one year, we had this guy come in, and you could tell that he was kind of coming off his um, Christmas shopping high. He stopped in, and he said he had, to, he had to get something for his whole family. He wanted a big piece of meat. He wanted pork. He wanted... A whole fresh ham. And uh, Juice Pig Joe said, "A whole? are you sure you want a whole ham? It's going to be 25 to 30 pounds, something like that. And the guy said, yes, I absolutely want the whole ham because I want the full effect. I want the full effect of Christmas for my family. Well, anyways, you know, December 23rd rolls around. This guy shows up to pick up the 32-pound hog leg or whatever it was. Maybe it was 40 pounds. I don't know. He was well aware of the size it was going to be anyways. Uh, wait for it. Here's a shocker. He didn't want it because it was too big. So what are we to do after the Christmas rush with the whole ham, you know, whole fresh ham trotter on and all? You know, meat moves kind of slowly right after the holidays. And the sausage case was totally full. The back sock was full. We weren't sure what we were going to do. Well, we had a couple items that we'd carry that really worked well for us for fresh hams or, or repurposing hams. One was an RTE item and the other was just an oven ready, uh, an oven ready item. Uh, The RTE item was a poached ham, actually most widely known as uh, Hambon de Paris or Parisian ham. So the way I like to prepare this leg is by seaming out each individual muscle of the ham. 
by using smaller muscles, you know, like the, the four main groups. They're easier to slice and handle later on. They're easier to present in the case, easier to eat. Uh, and by breaking it down, both the brine and cook times are, are super reduced. The smaller slices look good as an item on a charcuterie board, like I mentioned. Uh, they fit well on a baguette. They slice easy because you've got a, probably a small slicer in your shop, something like that. Uh, they're great on a baguette with mustard pickles and some raw onions, whatever. You can leave the skin on if you want and the full fat cap. Uh, however, I usually crisp up that skin to, to use later um, in the oven-ready recipe. So I'll trim the fat down to about a quarter, maybe a third of an inch. I denude, devein, and you know generally clean up each of the four main muscle groups, the top, the bottom, the eye, and the knuckle. Next, I'll make the brine. So this is it's a brine tam that you poach somewhat slowly. Now for the brine, if I'm going to brine something overnight, like some whole whole chickens, you know, uh, some fryers, some ribs, some butts, whatever, if I'm just going to do something quickly overnight to smoke the next day, I'll use maybe a 10% salinity solution, you know, it's fast, it's potent, it gets the job mostly done very quickly. If I'm going to be more precise, however, like when I'm making something for a restaurant or as a retail product that I want to be able to make a lot of with a very consistent result, I'll use a method to determine uh, exact desirable salinity. And I'll use this same method to figure out how much sugar I need and whatever nitrite I'll be utilizing, whether it be celery juice powder or you know, the chemical variety. So I adapted this recipe or method from Paul Bertoli's brining technique in, in his uh, must-read cookbook, Cooking by Hand. In this book, he basically explains each and every one of his labor-intensive and exacting recipes uh, that he actually uses at his restaurant, or used at his restaurant, Oliveto. So it's kind of a story about food, it's a lot of technique, and it's the reasons why they work so well. And this is a really great way to figure out a brine. It's easy math, it's it's kind of wordy and uh, sounds more complex when I describe it than it is when you just look at the method in the book. So I, I highly suggest you get the book if you can find it. The important thing that Chef Bertoli points out is that when you're calculating salinity or saltiness of the brine, it's important to consider that the water that makes up a large part of the meat itself needs to be accounted for. So raw meat tends to be 65 to 70% water, and you want uh, 4 to 5% salinity in your brine by weight. So when you're weighing your water that you're going to use for your brine, you also have to weigh the meat and account for the water in that, which is 65% of that weight. If you don't do that, the meat will effectively dilute the brine. So, um, again, I, I've got kind of a salty palate, so I brine at uh, three and three quarters percent in this case. And then by the time you're done using your nitrite, it'll kick it up a little bit further. If you're using like a pink salt, you know, a nitrite mix. Chef Bertoli prefers three percent. Um, and he considers that to be the bare minimum to reach equilibrium of salinity. So, again, this method is very well explained in the chef's book, Cooking by Hand. I highly recommend buying a copy, keeping it in your kitchen. It's a, it's a true resource. But I'll try to explain this method uh, in a nutshell. First, weigh your meat. That's the first thing. Write that down. Have your little notebook, Okay. Next, grab a container. I, I like five-gallon buckets. I think they work really great. Or those weird square buckets that the hog casings come in. You know, something that's easy and fits on a postage scale or, a, you know, a butcher shop size scale top. You want to fill, you want to, you know, throw the meat in the bucket after it's been weighed. Um, and then fill the bucket with water until the meat's submerged by two or three inches. Pour off the water into another bucket and then get your weight. So, you know, your second bucket, you want to get a tear on your scale and 
pour the water into the bucket that was covering the meat, and then weigh that and see what the total weight is. Now take the weight of your meat and multiply it by 0.65. That will account for the water that's in the meat. So let's say you have the four muscles from your ham uh, are each three pounds. So you're going to calculate the water in that. 65% of 12 is 7.8 pounds. Now you're going to weigh your water. Let's say it takes... uh, Two gallons to cover these these muscles, right? So water weighs 8.33 pounds per gallon. So two gallons is going to weigh uh, 16.66 pounds. Then you're going to add your 7.8 pounds of water that was in the meat already, 65% of the total meat weight. That's 7.8 pounds. So you're going to add the weight of the water, that you measured to cover the meat, and then you're going to weigh the assumed water weight within the muscles themselves to come up to, uh, in this case, 24.46 pounds. So, from here, to figure out the amount of salt you need, you're looking for a 4% salinity. So you're going to multiply your total water weight by 004 In this case, it's 24.46 pounds of water weight multiplied by 0.04, which is 4% salinity for the salt. You'll come up with 0.98 pounds of salt. Next, you'll do the same for your sugar. I like 3% sugar in this particular recipe. So we'll take my total water weight, 24.46 pounds, multiply it by 0.03 or 3%, and you'll get 0.03. 73 pounds of sugar. Now to determine how much curing salt you need, here's the formula. This is kind of heady, so like I said, take a look inside the book for the the visual representation of this equation because it makes a lot more sense. But hopefully this will, if you can follow me here, this will be useful. So to determine how much curing salt to use, here's the formula. The ratio is based off of the raw meat weight plus the total brine weight which includes the water, the salt, and the brine. So you have to, in this case, add the meat weight, which was 12 pounds, to the water weight, which was, and this is the water to cover, 16.06, plus the weight of the salt, 0.98, plus the weight of the sugar, 0.73. This makes up the total brine weight, or I guess the total weight of everything, including the brine and the meat. Now, from here, I just kind of follow Paul's formula. I know there's a lot of ways to arrive at this number, but this is the one that I use and have memorized. So, first, you have to find out uh, how much pure nitrite you need. And in this case, um, we'll be using a mix, but we'll show a conversion for that later. So, to find the pure nitrite itself, your equation is as such. 200 times the total brine and meat weight. Divide that by 1 million. Now, pink salt is only 6.25% pure nitrite. So, you take the number from the equation that I just gave and divide that by 0.0625. That number will give you the amount of pink salt that you need. So, in this case, here's our formula with our numbers plugged in. To find the pure nitrite, we do 200, which represents the parts per million of nitrite. Multiply that by the total brine and meat weight. So that's 16.66 pounds for the total brine and 12 even for the meat. That brings us to 28.66. So 200 parts per million multiplied by 28.66 pounds divided by 1 million gives us 0.0057 pounds of pure nitrite. Now, we need to put that into the formula uh, for pink salt, because that's probably what I'll be using. Um, So I'm going to divide that by 0.0625, and that gives me a 0.09 pounds of pink salt that I'll be adding 
to my brine. From here, I assemble the brine just like anything else. Um, I don't boil it. I just use the hottest water that the tap in the plant will use because uh, it's a lot faster. From here, I use, again, I, I, I use that water that's warm enough to dissolve the salts and the sugar. Um, off to the side, I boil a, between a pint and a quart of water, you know, that I would use for the brine. Uh, with one star anise, one tablespoon whole clove, one tablespoon cinnamon stick, kind of coarsely chopped or, or ground up a little bit, and uh, one bay leaf. And then I cool the brine down. I get it down to the walk-in cooler temp. I like to do it the day before if I can. Now, if you have a stitch tumbler, a, a vacuum tum, uh, or or if you have a uh, a vacuum pumper, rather, you know, I suggest pumping each muscle with twelve percent of its weight with brine. If you don't have a pumper, I like to submerge each one of them under three inches of brine for two days per pound, with a um, with a minimum of three days though. So if if you just have one pound muscles, then I leave them in for three days. Once you got them out of the, br- out of the brine, uh, you want to place the mini hams into a hotel pan or a stock pot. I add one coarsely chopped onion, uh, four cloves of garlic, one tablespoon of black pepper, one tablespoon of thyme, one tablespoon of rosemary, one teaspoon each of clove and allspice, uh, one star anise, one bay leaf, two quarts of whatever stock you've got around, six quarts of water, and uh, two large carrots, coarsely chopped. I poach them no higher than a simmer, or about, you know, 205 in an oven, uh, until they're cooked with an internal temp of 145, and then I remove them from the heat, and I allow them to cool in the braising liquid. Wow, that's a lot of talking. But... In the end, you've got a nice, sweet, salty, fully cooked, ready-to-eat ham that you can either put in your in your uh, charcuterie board and just slice it to order, or you can use on sandwiches if you've got that sort of set up in your shop, or you could sell it as just a, a sliced deli meat. Now for an oven-ready selection, the one that we used to do on Fat Kid Tuesdays was schnitzel. Who doesn't like schnitzel? So we take all the muscles and we kind of break them down into uh, the right size to have a nice cutlet, about an eighth of an inch thick or so. Some people will do like a quarter inch thick and pound the hell out of them. I I guess I don't know if I think it's totally necessary. You could put them through the cuber if you have one um, to make it super, super tender. I, I like it. I don't mind slicing my schnitzel with a knife, I guess you just need to do a test run in your shop and see what works for you. I I like making people chew because it's what you're supposed to do, but um, if cube steaks are real popular at your place, then cube them up. Now, this is a little bit more involving production-wise, I guess, but our shop had some grocery items in in, uh, our neighboring shops, and there was a pantry at the restaurant next door, so we were able to make a three-step breading kit right there on the block early in the morning uh, and then do a clean down before we process more meat. So if you're going to make a three-step breading kit, you want something really, really easy. So in the first tub, just grab yourself a bus tub or a sheet tray or whatever, do a couple cups of flour and mix in one tablespoon garlic powder, a teaspoon of, of onion powder, a tablespoon, a, t- a teaspoon of salt, and uh, a large pinch of black pepper. Stir that up with a fork so it's nice and distributed. In your second tub, you're going to have, you know, two to four eggs and a cup of milk. Whisk that up. And then in your third one, you're going to have um, breadcrumbs that you've done in the oven. And if you save that pork skin from the first one, if you were to crisp those up in the oven like chicharrones and then put those into a food processor and blend those while you're blending up your breadcrumbs, you could have like a porky, savory gremolata sort of thing going on. So, I don't know, I'd take the fine breadcrumbs, take your uh, cr- 
crumbed up chicharrones, some fresh herbs, a little bit of salt, and then make that your last step. So you take your cubed up or just sliced pork leg muscles. They're cutlets. Take your pork cutlets, put them through your three-step breading system, um, flour and seasonings, egg wash, breadcrumbs, and then package them up in a nice little bundle, like a little envelope almost, in, say, half-pound portions or one-pound portions. Fold them up, display them really nice on a plate, and people will come in all day. And they, they don't really get soggy. They stay kind of nice if you don't overdo it on the egg wash. And uh, you could sell them by the portion, and people really liked it when we did that. Or you could just put it in a tray. You don't have to wrap them up with little packages. Um, this guy, Joe, that I used to work with is really into origami, so he was always, you know, he'd make like, He'd make like a butcher paper swan that had some pork cutlets on it. I don't know. Hell of a merchandiser. Anyways, I hope I hope you all kind of enjoyed these um, ideas or hated them and inspired you to do something completely different. And as always, if you have any ideas about creative ways to merchandise hog legs, just drop us a line at the meat block on Instagram or. Um, at any one of our individual accounts. All right, riveting stuff. All right, I'm going to give a couple suggestions of what to do with a hog leg. Now, if you are whole carcass, uh, then you know how to trim it to your specifications. But if you're ordering a ham or a hog leg or a leg of pork or whatever it's called, um, always ask your supplier to make sure it doesn't have the sirloin still on unless you need it for your specifications that you're going to make like a Jambone Royale or you're going to make a um, Bayonne ham or Serrano where you want that sirloin attached to it. For the most part, for American hams and for, uh, you know, city hams or three-piece hams, you're you're really not. Um, And sometimes the supplier or the breaking house may want, sometimes we'll put that on the order to get that extra weight because it is a by pound uh, price per pound industry. And in an industry where there is not set terminology and vagueness, sometimes people put it on there to make their weight or sometimes people leave it on there because they don't know what the chef or the consumer wants. So one thing I'll tell you, what to do if you do get a uh, sirloin on your ham. One thing you could possibly do is make a, you know, like almost like a spec or a, or by own ham. What you're going to want to do with that is leave the trotter on, leave the skin on, and then you're going to uh, work what would be the top round with a rolling pin or a axe handle. Then you're going to work the femoral artery in the bottom round to get all the excess blood out because when you go and hang this uh and there's that blood in there because you're gonna be hanging this for maybe up to two years that will sour and that's where little creepy crawlies literally will get in is on the tip of that h bone deep in that femoral artery and i forgot to mention take off half the h bone pop it at the joint between the h and the tailbone and then continue to remove the rest of the H bone. And then I would snap it so it leaves that point of cartilage in there so you don't get a big dig mark from that point or possibly use a small handsaw to cut the bone and leave it in there during the curing process. Recipes vary. Uh, Just use the standard 1.25%, you know, nitrate. It could be saltpeter. It could be pink salt one or two. Then using coarse salt and sugar, I would uh, put it in a tote or uh, in a bag and shovel it on there so there's there's a good amount. Then you're going to leave that for, and I would recommend doing two days per kg. You have a 15 kg ham with the trotter on and all that. I would recommend, you know, 30 days. And this is under refrigeration or a tempered controlled environment, preferably below 40 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Make sure you rotate it, uh, you know, every other day or so. Then after 
then after this time, brush it off with your hand and then, you know, do a light rinse on it. Then hang it, you know, you're most likely going to hang it in a cooler for about 60 to 90 days. After this time frame, I would take it, cover the exposed area where you remove the H bone and the tailbone, which is now your exposed lean section, and cover it with a whipped lard. And this is where you could be creative with your spices. And now you're going to find a basement or a room in your garage or some place that with relatively low humidity, and you're going to hang it there for two years. Then you're going to crack it open, hope you did it right, hope there was nothing wrong, and then slice it. I've made about 12 of these. Each one is different. Each one takes on the environment of the place where I've made it. Some of them were good. Some of them were bad. And what I encourage during this process is taking rigorous notes from dates and times when you put them in environment to environment. And also take weights. You're going to want about a 30% drop from your initial starting weight to your finished product weight. And if this is something you seriously want to do, message me and I'll give you further details. This next piece is by Ryan. As I said before, I do see a lot of pork legs. So I'm going to segue into pork legs now at this point. Some farmers will ask us to hold the whole leg for them for smoking. They'll smoke the whole hind leg, but this is not so common because this requires that the farmer pay additional fees to a specialty processor, USDA processor, who will then smoke the legs for them. Most of the farmers we work with will have us cut the hind leg into two to three inch cubes to be sold as kebab meat. Also very commonly we'll create boneless roasts from the top round and the sirloin tip And then turn the bottom and the eye of round into kebab meat. These roasts and kebabs, though not super fancy, sell quite well at farm stores in the various retail locations our farmers bring product to. Although sausages, pork chops, and shoulder butts are going to sell most easily, it's usually not too much of a stretch to move some kebab and boneless roasts also from the hind leg. If your company has a smokehouse or value-added program, then there's a a ton of great possible directions to point a pork leg. Now, my company has a raw sausage program, and that's it. No smokehouse, no curing, no brining. We don't do any of that stuff. We produce vacuum sealed frozen cuts. We'll make patties if you want us to, uh, sausage links if you want us to. We use some very basic seasonings we'll mix in, grind in, and we'll do patties or links. It's very basic, but still a very useful and in-demand service we provide to farmers. Like I said, a few farmers will then go to extra measures to pay another company to further process their pork bellies into a smoked bacon, for example. But most just sell as is and rely upon a customer base that wants to buy plain old frozen cuts. Though a brined ham is an attractive thing, most American consumers seem to reliably want their hams in the form of either deli cold cuts or clustered at the holiday times. Now I have several homesteading friends in various places around the country that raise hogs. They'll usually brine and smoke their pork legs. Commonly, homesteaders will keep a few hogs, usually less than a dozen. They'll make use of the pig's soil tilling and manuring abilities around the farm while they're alive. And then they'll sell a few custom exempt once they're dead. And then they'll keep a couple, one or two or however many, to fill their own freezers and larders. That's a pretty standard template right there. Sell a few, custom exempt, keep a few. Nothing wrong. Nothing wrong with that. Though true homesteaders represent a very minuscule portion of the population, it's still interesting to think like a homesteader sometimes. Mostly when it comes to hogs, 
Homesteader ultimately is going to ask him or herself, what do I want to do with this pig carcass that I'm planning on feeding my family with? That's the fundamental question. And this question is closely related to another question the homesteader must ask, which is, how do I like to eat pork? And then that'll determine what they end up doing in their processing of that carcass to figure out uh, what they want to do with it based on how they like to eat and how their family likes to eat. I have a buddy, really good friend of mine, named Kyle. He lives in rural New Mexico on a 10-acre plot of land in the Gila National Forest. Very rural. The population in the nearest town is 100 people. This is where he grew up, and then he returned there eight years ago to plow with draft horses and try to make a livelihood from growing a dozen varieties of vegetables to sell at the farmer's market every Saturday, which was uh, two hours from his house. They'd drive there. They did drive there and sell their veggies there. And pigs have been just a side project for him, a means to grow some protein and fat to feed him and his wife and his two kids. Up till now, he always brined a country ham from the hind leg. Recently, as in last year, he did his first prosciutto, or at least he tried to do it. He did it without the use of pink salts or celery salts. He hung it in his pump house for 12 months, checking ambient temps and mold growth periodically. He was pretty skeptical that it would actually turn out edible. At one point, there were some green molds that grew on there that concerned him. But uh, he was planning on coming back to wipe those off, wash those off with vinegar. But by the time he did get back there to do that, some white penicillin mold had begun to grow. And over the next period of time, the white mold took over and outcompeted all the other molds. And... Uh, stayed from that point on. Now that he has 12 months have gone by and he's been slicing off off of it and eating it, I just talked to him recently and he said he could not be happier with the outcome. He enjoys the flavor so much better than the brine hams he had done previously. And he finds the fact that it's shelf-stable to be super useful. Now he said he's turning all his pork legs into prosciutto from here on in. Kyle is an example of someone who's not at all caught up in any of the hype surrounding the world of charcuterie. He's clued into food trends relevant to his vegetable operation, but his decision to make a prosciutto came more from a practical desire to produce useful, enjoyable food for his himself and his family. And the fact is that ham and sausage can get boring after a while, after a number of years of of eating it. Most of the cured meat products I often hear about happen in the backyards and basements of people extremely entrenched in, in an urban food scene. Now, I love to eat some cured meats, and I have a very soft place in my heart for charcuterie geeks because I'm a meat geek of sorts myself. But cured meats have developed a bad rap because they're often extremely expensive and not very easy for the average person to bring into their home and be successful with. Charcuterie is perceived as a high-end specialty product and these days is marketed and sold that way. So it was really good for me to hear my friend Kyle's perspective on the prosciutto he made and it reminded me that dry curing a ham leg doesn't have to be a high-end, super chefy affair. It can also be extremely down-to-earth, straightforward, useful, and practical. All right, this is Travis again. I'm going to tell you real quick how to get better techniques on making your three-piece hams. A lot of people that I see do cross-cut hams, or I see this online, is that they don't have good... Um, you know, meat glue or, and I'm not talking meat glue in the sense of like a powder or a collagen thing that you 
you know, use, um, you could use the natural uh, protein extraction from your whole muscle to create myosin, just like you would when you make sausage to make it somewhat tacky to get a three muscle ham to stick and fuse together as if it was a single piece. So you have three pieces, or let's just say two pieces. You have a top round and a bottom round. On the inside of those uh, two pieces, I'd recommend cross-hatching it so you make it look like a checkerboard uh, or X, uh, or a tic-tac-toe board, um, just scoring it about half an inch to an inch down. And then I would take it and inject it to a 15% cure to lean ratio. Now, the one piece of equipment you're going to need besides an injector, you can also use a, uh, is a vacuum tumbler. And they make small vacuum tumblers. So if you're running a small shop and not like a huge processor, um, this is reasonable. And you need the space as a tumbler. You don't want to fill your tumbler up too much because it won't knock around. What you want it to do in under vacuum is get aggregated and hit each other. And that with, you know, the salt and the cure and in the brine, that's going to allow it to get that tacky myosin protein extraction. And you really only need about three hours of total tumbling time. That could be on a tumble pause cycle where it repeats that every three minutes, or it could be continuous. It really all depends what your equipment allows you to do. Then using a horn, put the two uh, cross hatch sections facing each other. So the lean is touching, and then what would be the fat cap would be on the outside. And then you're going to net that together. And that cross hatching is going to act like a zipper and fuse the muscles during the cooking process. And that's one technique to get large muscle hams or deli style hams in a small shop. All right. There's not going to be an outro on this episode because I don't have that equipment with me because I'm kind of not living at my house as we're showing it. Until next time, keep your knives sharp and live in the margin. Real quick, you could do the same technique using single muscles where you don't have to build myosin, but you would still tumble it to ensure cure penetration. Uh, You could also take the top, bottom, and uh, knuckle and cut them into you know, cutlets. There are many things we did not touch on in this episode, and I would love to in future episodes. Uh, Yeah.